What is going on YouTube? My name is Andrew, aka the Black Dragon. This is Black Dragon Studios. And we're back with another episode of I Play Raid Shadow Legends. Today I'm going to be going into the Doom Tower. I'm going to show you guys some of my Doom Tower wave strategies here. That I have. Uh, just a little bit about me for those who don't know me. I am fairly new to Raid. I wouldn't say that I'm like super new. Um, doesn't tell me what day I'm on. Why doesn't it tell me what day I'm on anymore? Uh, just past 240, so I'm at like 250 days. Don't mind the Wild West music in the background. I don't know why. I got a little hinker in for some old shootout music. It's really loud at the moment. I think that's I think that's good. Probably can't even hear it now. But yeah, we just started the new Doom Tower right now. And I'm on Doom Tower Hard, and I just thought, you know what? It might be good to show these people how I do my Doom Tower waves. It's not going to be pretty. <laughs> I'm not a whale. Um, I don't spend a lot of money on this game. I'm kind of on strike. I'm kind of doing a Plarium strike at the moment. I'll only buy the monthly gem pack and any pack that equates in value to the monthly gem pack so I think you're basically getting like uh, five times your money for the month for what you pay for the monthly gem pack and then every other pack in my opinion is just you're getting at most two times for your money so it's not even that good so I just don't buy them anymore so I'm really struggling to progress in this game right now for that reason because I'm not pulling as many shards, I'm not doing as much farming, I'm not getting as much gear, I'm not leveling as much champs to level 60, but we still work it, you know, we still work it. So how I do Doom Tower Waves is I just check, the. this is the final wave, it'll show you here. Uh, you can click on the champion and it does not do anything, so you don't actually get to see uh, what champion you can see what other people are using if you click best teams Currently no players have done it Global rankings and then it'll show what people are using you probably won't have those champs though. So don't bother looking at that list Yeah Yeah, and if you're uh, If you're using champs on that list, you're probably not needing to watch this video right now just saying, unless you like listening to me, which I can't figure out why anybody would want to do that. You're probably like me, and you probably uh, need a little tune-up in the Doom Tower department. So going over here, I'm seeing two Lysandras. Not, not really caring about Lysandras and Doom Tower waves. That's a good thing, actually. A Gurgo is going to freeze our whole team if we let him. Uh, don't know what this guy does. That's probably a good thing. If you don't know the champ, you're probably in good shape to get past the wave. And then we got a, uh, a really bad epic here. So this is going to be a really easy wave. I would just say maybe a little bit of crowd control. I'm going to throw Renegade in there because he's going to cool down our, uh, our skills by two turns. Um... Doesn't look like they'll be doing a whole lot of buffing, so I could probably take out Hope for this for this one. She does AoE, uh, what the hell am I doing here? She does an AoE remove buff strip or whatever. I'm wondering if I might be able to just power through these waves. Well, you can always try it. I mean... I got this build here. It's kind of like a Poison Explorer build. I gave it one shot. If they can't do it, then I just... I actually put a real team in there. <laughs> so let's see if they... Their speeds are not going to be... These guys are going to be way too fast for my team. I don't imagine that it'll work, but it might. So it's basically just put all a bunch of poisons on them and then blow them up before all this shenanigans happens. See, they're way too fast. Doom Tower waves are not like 
waves in Dragon 20. <laughs> They're a lot faster, they have a lot more resistance, they have a lot more accuracy, uh, and a lot more speed. So you've got to plan accordingly for that, and they've got better champions as well. Yeah, we're about to just drop here, I would imagine. Unless we can get a reset from Renegade real quick? Probably not, because our whole team's about to get frozen. At least we get a sneak peek at what these waves are going to be doing. Pretty much nothing. Pretty much nothing. See, this is not a threatening wave to me, so it's easy to get through. Floor 2F. <laughs> okay, so let's go with... Remove D. We'll put a Mazo Mage in there so we can remove any uh, pesky debuffs on the spot. We'll get that cooled down to like a one or two turn cooldown with Renegade. Probably want to put Necrit. For resist. I'll throw in a Rector Draft for added resistance. And then now I need a damage dealer. So usually I would take like a, a Spirit Nuker or a, Yeah, I would take a Spirit Nuker against a, a red and two green um, icons here. So I'll put in Shazar. It's not going to be, like I said, it's... You know what, it's not going to be pretty. Um, I'll just throw in Godseeker so we can increase the buff duration of Necrit's shields and uh, block buffs. That's what Necrit's in there for. Mazo Mage also has block debuffs as well. So we're going to just have a... We're going to have a constant flurry of, uh, of blocking buffs going on here. Blocking debuffs. I meant to say. And then Shazar is just going to be mowing them down. Slowly but surely. So he does have enough accuracy to land those bombs. His accuracy would be about 300. If you have 250 accuracy for this wave, you'll probably get through it. I'm not going to be getting real specific with today's video. I'm not going to be doing build tutorials. I'm not going to show you the builds or anything like Because we would just be sitting here all day. It's just going to be say, me talking, talking about what's happening. Talking about certain particulars of things that are going on in the build. Synergies like Necrot and Godseeker are just synergistic. They go together like ham and cheese, man. They have to be together. Because... She's increasing the duration of all of his buffs, and then Renegade is resetting the cooldowns of all of them. And as well, when Necker goes down, Godseeker will just keep reviving him and resetting his cooldowns as well. So it's pretty much endless, endless uh, ally protect, strengthen, which is 25% less damage overall from anything, and uh, block debuffs. And Mazo Mage is going to put up block debuffs, increased crit rate, and increased defense. So it's it's pretty it's a pretty slick um, team when they're not removing the buffs. That's when I go for uh, buffing a lot. And you'll just notice, you know, uh, you'll get through these waves pretty quick, even though we don't have a lot of offense right now. We're not dying, so we don't need Arbiter reviving all. We're not going to all go down. We're not Humpty Dumpty. We don't all go down. We don't all fall down. But some waves will be like that. Some waves will be really annoying. It'll just seem to have an answer for everything, and you might need a revive all for many Doom Terror waves. <laughs> mm. 
A lot of resistance. Really good idea when you're building for Doom Tower waves. Um, just treat it like a dungeon. Treat it like Doom Tower hard. Treat it like Dragon 25. Treat it like Ice Golem 25. Uh, Fire Knight 25. You're going to want resistance built into your team uh, to some degree. I mean, Necrit is a great lead because he has a 68 resistance in all battles aura. And that's fantastic. Now, he and Mazumage doing a lot of buffing. So they both have Solidarity Mastery, which increases ally resist by 5 for each buff placed on them by this champion. So all of your allies get that increased resistance. Rector Draft is another great resistance Doom Tower champion because when your team is perfect failed... They'll take 15% less damage, and they'll also take, uh, they'll also gain 50 resistance. Um, as well, she does have a 55 team resistance in Doom Tower battles as well, so she's really good for a lead in a Doom Tower squad, if you need one. Well, she'll just throw on a 100 resist to your team right there. Obviously, Great Hall. You can level your Great Hall. As right now, I got 80 resistance in my Great Hall for Void Affinity Champions and Force Affinity Champions. So, I'm not hurting in the resistance department, to say the least. Mazo Mage has 390 resist without any buffs. So he's got about, after all these buffs are on my team, if you count them up, that's about 90 resist just off the buffs. And then 60 from Necrit, there's a 150. Just off that alone for the whole team. So Mazo's running at like 550 resist. So he'll never take a debuff. Five minutes is an appropriate time to get through a Doom Tower level. Some will take longer because they have counter-attack champions, but you can easily get through those with buff stripping or buff decreased buff duration. But you're going to want at least 250 accuracy, bare minimum. Try to get it to 300 for your debuffers when you're going into the Doom Tower hard. Here we have another relatively easy wave. This wave here is not likely going to give us any problems at all because, well, maybe the Queen Eva will because she does have block revive, but I think we'll just go through with the exact same squad. And that's a nice thing about the Doom Tower is there's a lot of floors where you can just use the same team that you just used on the last floor. So yeah, when you're on Doom Tower hard, by this time, you're probably going to want shoot for a base like 2500 defense on all your defensive champs, your revivers, etc, etc. Uh, shoot for about 3500. This is just general tips and tricks. I'm not saying it's a set fast rule, just in general. Um, on your nukers, like Lord Chazar, 3,500, 4,000 attack is generally pretty decent. Um, starting point for this point in the game for a nuker. Um, make sure your champions are built properly. Make sure that they have glyphs on them. Make sure that you should know all this stuff by now anyways. But I'm just saying, right, like, you're going to want to use your best champions for the Doom Tower Hard because it is not... A fun place to be if you're using mediocre champs. So yeah, it was another nice thing about Godseeker is she's in relentless gear, so she can take extra turns. She has a heal the whole team and decrease buff duration 
and increased buff duration of our team. So she decreases the duration of their buffs by one turn, and she increases the duration of all our team buffs by one turn, plus she heals them by 25%. And then she has a revive on death passive that procs when somebody dies. And then she has an actual revive as well, and those are on very low cooldowns. So with Renegades cooling down our skills quicker, um, it just makes all of our skills so much more potent because they're always available to use. If you have a champion like Warlord, you're obviously sitting pretty. Warlord is probably one of the best Doom Tower crowd control champions that you could possibly have. And you could bring him in here with his arena build because it'll have accuracy on it. It'll have speed on it. And then you're just going to have to deal with A1s for the whole match. Another great Doom Tower champion that you guys could use to clear waves super fast is a champion known as Seer. Not Blind Seer, not to be confused with the other one, just Seer. And uh, so basically you just buff with Mazo Mage or a champion that just does a bunch of team buffs, like three or four team buffs. And you could kill a whole wave just off that and just clear waves like that. You could use the build that I was that I was showing earlier, the poison explorer build, the combust build, but it has to be fast. It has to be a lot faster than if you were using it on Dragon 25 or Dragon 22 or something like that. As you notice these champions, you're you're uh they're not going super fast, but they are going a little bit faster. What is their speed requirements for the Doom Tower? Uh, on your Nuker, I would say anywhere between 170 to 195 speed is perfectly fine. Anything under 170 speed, you're probably going to be just going way too slow. Um, on your defensive champs and your revivers, um, etc, etc. You're probably going to want anywhere between 215 to 240 speed. Um, and then on your speed lead, say you want to throw in an Arbiter or you want to throw in a Lysandra or a Deacon Armstrong, uh, you're probably going to want to have them at like 300 speed, just bare minimum, 300. I'm just saying bare minimum, like 285 is fine. 290, you're not going to really have an issue. But if your speed leads are not running even at 260 speed, they're running at like 240 speed, they're not really going to be helping you all that much. But yeah, five minutes, if you don't have any of those exploder builds or those uh, seer builds, Five minutes is a great time to get through. It's just an average time to get through a Doom Tower wave. Yeah, like I said, it's not even going to have any issues with that wave there. Now we got a Trenda. A Hawkorn Smash Lord. It's pretty annoying. It can be really annoying, actually. And then three champions from the Banner Lords, so we already know they're probably not going to be that good. Want to switch out the Nuker here? I'm seeing four Magic Affinity Champions and a Spirit Affinity Champion. So, I mean, I could throw in a Zargala for this one. She does have nuking capabilities. She also has uh, decreased defense. As well as a weaken on her A1, so she's gonna do AoE decreased defense. AoE decreased defense and weaken is really good to get through Doom Tower waves as well, because they do have a lot of HP. Crit damage, crit rate, you know, damaging stats. It's all good stuff. Let's see here, do we have an op for less? I don't think we need Mazo Mage anymore, so we could probably throw in somebody like um, a Bellower. 
and do even more damage quicker. Could do that. I could even throw in a Taurus, you know, poison their whole team. <laughs> Seen that working with Renegade pretty well, poison their whole team. Let's go ahead and try that. Throw in a Taurus there and yeah, yeah, it'll be great. We'll do it that way. So we'll not only be nuking them this time around, but we'll also be killing them with many, many poisons. Poisons, HP burns, AoE is Okay, they're going to be uh, removing buffs and then placing block debuffs. Okay. Right away when I see that, that's what the Hawkorn and Smash Lords are famous for. I should have... I knew they were annoying, I just didn't know exactly what they did. I forgot. Yeah, so for this one, we're going to throw in a buff stripper. So Hope is great. Madame Saris is also great. Any buff stripper is great in this situation. Um, debuffing their team is probably not going to be the best option. They're just getting rid of those block buffs as quickly as possible is going to be the solution here. I uh, could even opt for a guy like Ugo and place block buffs, but since they're going to be removing the buffs and then placing block debuffs, Ugo's completely useless in this situation. It's just a matter of grinding it out with Hope, Renegade, and uh, Zargala. And then just using Necrid and, and Godseeker to keep them alive. Uh, Godseeker could be Cell of the Drakes. Uh, Necrid could be Miscreated Monster. You know, just, you know, just great defensive champs that... Do all kinds of cool things like put fear counters on their team or uh, um, prevent them from damaging you, like healing your team, reviving your team, stuff like that. Obviously, Duchess, you know, Duchess, Seafies, those types of revivers. Um, Rector Drass would be great options as your primary reviver. Arbiter, if you don't have any of those options. Everybody can get Arbiter, so. They're also going to place Provokes, which is hella annoying, and stuns. This is great. And now they're going for my Reviver, so. Um, you know, problem solving. We may have to go for a second Reviver in this situation. Because of what's happening here, it's, you know, they're just, this is what Hawkorn Smash Lords do when they're at level 250 in the Doom Tower. They're really friggin' annoying. I can't stress this enough. So we'll take out Cooldown Man, we'll put in Sill of the Drakes for a little bit of crowd control and revive. And, uh, yeah, this should work a lot better. And then we'll put in... We're going to have to use a Mazo Mage here, and then and then we're going to put in a Zargala. And hopefully this will quell the storm. They also have double Ignatius. Sorry, is that triple Ignatius? No, double Ignatius on this first wave, so... <laughs> yeah. Just super, super annoying. I don't know why this wave always gets me so much, but it just does. I think we should be good now. I think we are capable of beating this wave, no problem. Now that we've kind of adjusted our sails a little bit. That's another tip I got for you guys. When you're in the Doom Tower, don't get too down on yourself and say, Oh, I can't beat this wave. It's impossible. Maybe so. Maybe so. But you know what? 
If you've been playing the game as long as I have, you've been playing the game for a minute, you've probably got at least 30 or 40 level 60s in your inventory by now. And they're probably all fully geared or damn well near it. Maybe not end game gear, but you know, they've got decent gear on them now. They've got about 300 accuracy, they've got about, you know, 200, 250 speed. They've got good HP, which would be like, you know, 40 or 50k HP, and 2500 to 4000 defense. Like, Godseeker ain't, she ain't rocking the min defense. She's on 4k defense and 45k HP. She is tanky as a sinner on Sunday. And look at this, we're just breezing, just breezing through this first wave. Once we put down those Hawkhorn Smash Lords, their whole wave just goes down, crashing. See, because they can't remove our buffs, they can only remove their own debuffs, so I just buff the hell, this is one of those situations where you just buff the hell out of your team. Yeah, they can remove the stuns, sure. But if they're stunned, they can't do anything anyway, so... Now we've got two, two Trundas to deal with here. Trunda's not really a big issue. Why I say that is because she doesn't have Madame going ahead of her, stripping your buffs and then placing decreased defense and decreased attack. Usually these trendas in the Doom Tower are even less powerful than the ones you'll see in Arena, even at level 250. They don't have a 100 crit rate, they don't have 300 crit damage, <laughs> you know, they're just, you know, they might have 150, 200 crit damage and 80 crit rate or 50 crit rate, but they're not going to be smacking you super hard as you can see here. Trendas in the Doom Tower is a good thing. <laughs> When you start seeing triple Cephy, double Crisk waves, that's when you get pissed off. Or quad Valk waves, that's when you get pissed off because it's going to take you an hour to get through the goddamn wave. Another tip I got, don't start re-gearing your champs just for one Doom Tower wave. It's not that important to your account that you switch out all the gear every friggin' wave just to get through a wave. Like, gear your champs one time. Gear them for all the areas of the game that they're going to be playing in, and that's it. Don't be switching gear over and over. That's a mistake I see too many players making oh so often. And you're going to waste your silver that way. There's already a shortage of silver. If you saw my silver count when I first logged in, it was very low because I just got out of a CVC and I just re-geared a champion. But if you're constantly re-gearing champions, you're going to be hurting because getting through one Doom Tower wave is certainly not worth a million silver. You can save the silver and just keep farming and getting better gear and you know you'll eventually get through the wave we're gonna four star chicken it's pretty good rewards in doom tower so it's definitely worth doing don't skimp on doom tower that's another mistake that i have made in my raid career Oh, I just won't do the Doom Tower today. Well, you'll just miss out on four glyphs, four post speed glyphs, 100 gems, three four star chicken, an epic book, a void shard. Yeah, but you know, go ahead and, and it's all free. Go ahead and skip the Doom Tower. Okay, so here we've got a Lucky Charms man. He's pretty annoying. He's gonna put revive on death and block debuffs up on all allies for two turns. Don't know what these champs do, I don't imagine that she does much. And then these other two champs, I'm not really threatened at all by this wave. 
What I'll do is I'll probably just put in a Void Nuker for this wave. Because there's too much going on here. And I'll just put him with Necrit because he'll do his ally attack as well. And we'll be getting a lot of ally attacks. I want to buzz with this uh, decreased speed as well. Mazo has an A1 decreased speed, which is really nice. But yeah, that's pretty much how I run a Doom Tower wave. Typically speaking, I run four defensive or crowd control champs and then one damage dealer. That's pretty much how it has to be done unless you have super crazy champs. Because they're just so, so friggin' powerful, these waves. So they're going to be placing uh, two continuous heals and an increased defense on all on all allies. That you know that's uh, that's recipe for disaster. That's a recipe for disaster, and with no way really to control them other than stunning. Well, we have yeah, we have God Seekers going to remove their uh, decrease the buff duration as well. And as you can see there, she only has 200 accuracy. She's still going to hit from time to time. She's not going to get resisted all the time. So even that is still fine. On a champion that doesn't really need a lot of accuracy because their skills don't really require a lot of accuracy. They're not, you know, they're not going to be missing you know, getting one or two resists, or, or even hell, being resisted by them all. Um, Godseeker only has one ability that requires accuracy, and it's not even super, super important all the time. So that's why I'm trying to say, like, certain champs don't put, like, 400 accuracy on them and skimp on the speed and skimp on the defense, you know, skimp on the HP because you wanted to get accuracy in him. The only champions that require a high amount of accuracy is champions that are only in there for crowd control. They're only in there to do one job, and that is to debuff the opponent. Then you're going to want as much accuracy on those champions as required. Sell the Drakes. I have my Sell the Drakes built out 300 accuracy. Uh, 200-ish resist, and uh, about 220 speed, with about uh, 2,500 defense and about 50k HP. So Scylla's pretty good, and he's also in reflex gear, so he's going to be getting his skills back a lot faster. The Cell can be put in stun gear as well. Stun gear will be just fine on Cell. So you'll not only have an 18% chance to stun, but you'll also have his regular, um, I think, what did it, is 40% chance to stun two times. So you're going to get a lot of stuns with Cell the Drakes, even without a stun set. If you have the correct amount of accuracy, you can see that these champions are still getting stunned. But yeah, on a Reviver plus Debuffer like Solid Drakes, you're going to need at least 210 speed. Bare minimum, if you don't have 210 speed on Solid Drakes, you've really got to farm up some good Perception gear, man. Because you can easily get 210 speed and 250 accuracy on Solid Drakes and still have a decent amount of HP and defense as well. So the Drakes does not need crit rate. So the Drakes does not need crit damage. Does not need attack. The only things you want on So the Drakes is speed, accuracy, defense, and HP percent. Those are the only four stats you should be looking for. And then preferably get him decked out in a set bonus like 
uh, Relentless or Reflex or or Stun Set. Bellower? See, look at what Bellower is doing to these waves, man. Bellower is my... Bellower is my campaign farmer. Bellower's got 270 crit damage and, uh, and about 4k attack. But he's only running at like 156 speed. But it's fine because with Necrit, he's going to get extra turns anyways, as you can see here. His HP doesn't matter because he's always got ally protect and shield so, and strengthen. And block debuffs and increased defense and increased speed like Silda Drakes. Another great thing about Silda Drakes. He has an increased speed. He just passes off a random increased speed at the beginning of his turn. He offers a 10% heal to the entire team at the beginning of his turn. So he's just he's a fantastic Doom Tower champion overall. Champions that place Provoke are also great. Um, I just picked up Visix the Unbowed the other day. Maybe we'll throw in Visix for a wave here. Even though she's not fully uh, built out yet, I think she'll be okay at level 50 with Necrid in there. And unbooked and everything. She does have a Provoke AoE. Another good Doom Char champion, Drexthar Blood Twin, another champion I just picked up. AoE, uh, he'll just place HP burns and provokes constantly on the opponent, so. Really good crowd control champ, plus he's on defense as well. All of his stats are defensive, so he's very tanky. This wave's going to take a little longer because I had to throw in a different nuker. And as you can see, the team here is never in any threat of dying. Okay, so this is going to be a really, really, really annoying wave. We've got two Ryan the Conjurers, so they're basically like buff strippers. And then another Harkorn Smash Lord, a Whirlum Frost King, and an Ursaga. So they're just going to be playing a lot of defense. They're playing a lot of defense. They're going to be stripping buffs and blocking debuffs of their own. I think I just go full CC for this one, honestly. I'll throw a Ninja. He can play offense and defense. Sell the Drakes could turn into Glazia Soul Glide. But she'll just constantly freeze them. And then she'll work off Ninja. And Ninja will just kill them. Mazo Mage. I could throw in Triple CC and just take out Mazo Mage because they're not going to be doing any damage. And then Renegade for resets. This is going to be really good. It's going to be an interesting change up here. I might have to manual this to start it off, but we're going to get, we're going to be, this is going to be funny. I'm going to throw in Painkeeper for extra cooldowns as well. <laughs> I'm going to try it this way. Okay, so let's start off with this. Freeze them up, and then place block debuffs on our own team. He froze most of them. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and freeze up everybody. There we go. Cool that down. Now, I don't need to use the stun with Sil just yet. And now place Weaken. And cool everything off. And we're off to the races. And this is just going to be funny. As long as they stay in tune here. Oh, 
this guy on the right here is giving us a little bit of a problem, but it's not that bad. Painkeeper does have a heal, still has a heal. We should be good here. You want to talk about crowd control? This is your ultimate crowd control team right here. We are doing no damage physically. It's all being done by HP burns. And these HP burns do a lot of damage. See, kid, that's... They're not really going to be doing a whole lot of damage to our squad, so I opted to go for a Pain Keeper instead of a second Reviver. I think just having one Reviver against these waves will be just fine. Against these types of waves. Yeah, because see what HP burn does is it's not like a poison where it just damages the person it's on. HP burn will damage the whole team, which is amazing. And with Ninja, you can activate the HP burns instantly. I'm going to do a little bit of manual just so we can get into the second wave with all of our skills intact. Because if we do miss a turn, we could end up running into a lot of problems. There, we froze up the Hawkorn and Smash Lord. That's a good start. Now we just need to get this Ryan the Conjurer. Actually, you know what? It doesn't matter. As long as we keep the Smash Lord at bay, I think we'll be okay for this wave. Okay, the Smash Lord just... No, oh, no. See, yeah, he didn't even. And now we're going to cool down our skills here. And we're off to the races again. There, the Smash Lord just got froze up by Glazia's A1. She has a freeze on her A1 as well. Glazia is a really good champion. I know I said in one video that she wasn't that good, but Glazia Soul Glide is actually one of the best crowd control champions in the game. A, because she's very tanky, and B, because she has really good base stats, and C, because she's really cool looking, and D, because her skills actually are really good. And work really good with other people that freeze as well, like Yukaro the Scourge, which you can now get for free in the clan shop. And Ninja, of course. Anybody that places an AoE freeze. Because she also has a debuff spread on her A1, so if the person is frozen, um, she will spread one random debuff, or two random debuffs from the frozen target to all the other champions on the opposing team. She also places block debuffs, which is really, really handy against debuffers. And yeah, see, our team is just really in sync right now. I don't think we should have a problem here. We just, yeah, we just stunned up the Smash Lord again, so it looks to me like we're going to be all right. And now we'll just cool down our skills with Renegade, and we'll be off to the races again. We'll cool those off right in time for the next freeze where we need it for the stun. Coming up right now, I would hope. I have Renegade running very fast. He's running 265 speed. He needs to be fast. For some reason, he didn't get his cooldowns, and now we're going to get into a lot of trouble here. Oh, no, still got a stun off. See, this is great. This is fantastic, the way this is working right now. I don't think one of our champions has dropped yet. And we're just, yeah, this is just ultimate lockdown right here. I did not expect it to go this well in the first try, but man oh man did it ever go well.
beat them at their own game. <laughs> That's what you want to do in the Doom Tower. You want to counter everything that they do. If they're doing a lot of CC, then you're going to need to do a lot more CC. If they're not doing as much CC, you can opt to just uh, a little bit of CC and then heavy damage. Here we got a Dracomorph, so drop defense and weaken. Double Tormund, so any turn meter boost, any buff, we're going to get punished for it by these two Tormunds. They're not going to be a, as bad as Arena Tormunds, but they're still going to be really annoying. And then a Sir Nick, so we're going to have to deal with basically unkillables and a bunch of continuous heals. And then Gurptuck. I don't really know what a whole lot about Gurptuck, but one thing I do know is we're not going to be wanting to buff our team a whole lot. Um, we're going to want to have block debuffs up as well, so Glazia is going to be really handy for this matchup. Um, probably take out the Pain Keeper for this one and throw in a Mazo Mage. He does have block debuffs as well. Try it this way. This sh This should do fine. I don't think we'll have any problems doing it this way. We could throw in a Demetha for extra heals and, and uh, all that fun stuff. But we're definitely not going to be wanting to do a whole lot of turn meter boosting in this particular matchup. I think this will be just fine. Definitely not going to want to use uh, Necrit in this matchup. It will get frozen a lot too, but you know what? Well, now that we have block debuffs up, we should be alright. Actually, there's no Tormans on the first wave. That's interesting. But look at this. We have no damage, and we're just, we're just ripping through their health with these HP burns. Ninja is such a great champ. If you... If you're on the ninja hate train, get off of it because he's not to be hated. I've said this in so many videos and I've seen so many people comment negatively on ninja. Ninja is one of the best champions in the game, dude. Look at how fast he just, he just melted through that entire wave on his own. On his own. Nobody else is doing damage on this team. Ninja just did that all on his own in a minute. And he doesn't even have damage built into his kit. I I didn't give him crit rate. I gave him 200 crit damage because I had to. To get his speed up. But he's running 245 speed, 27% crit damage. 500 accuracy. And that's it. He doesn't have HP. He doesn't have defense. Just 245 speed and 500 accuracy is how I have my ninja build. And that's it. And he will just do this to waves. See, we're not we're not even in it. We're not under any threat right now whatsoever. Even still. Do we have Sills Revive coming up here? And their whole team's gonna be frozen, so. We almost got the first Tormund down. Two Tormunds are about to go down. So yeah, their Tormunds are just not able to do anything in this matchup. Other than just sit there and be frozen the whole time. <laughs> Again, beating them at their own game. Going into the third wave at about three minutes. Not what I was expecting. I expected it to take a little bit longer than that. But with Mazo Mage clearing off those debuffs and not taking any debuffs himself, it should be just fine.
If you don't have a renegade, you can use a pain keeper or a Prince Kaimar if you're fortunate enough to have one. Prince Kaimar would be your best option for a cooldown champ. If you don't have any of those options, then uh, I guess putting your champions in uh, in reflex gear or uh, relentless gear is your next best option. But again, if it's not good gear and your stats are still bad, but you have the reflex set or you have your relentless set, it's probably not a good idea to go ahead and put that on because if your champion's running at 130 speed and 150 accuracy, you're not getting a benefit at all from having a reflex set or a relentless set on your champion at that point. I can guarantee you that. You're not going to be happy about that decision. Nice thing about the Doom Tower, you don't lose a key for exiting the match. You don't lose a key for losing the match. You can always redo the match until you figure it out. And then once you beat the match, you then lose the key, which is to be expected. I mean... Again, here we are. Five minutes into the run, and we only have two Tormans left to put down. We are in no threat of dying, and this is just great. Uh, Gazia Soul Glide is a really good champion to put with an uh, ally attack champion or a counter attack champion because she'll just freeze up their whole team constantly. They'll never be unfrozen. Okay, we've got about the world's easiest wave here. We've got two rares and three unknown epics. And all magic affinity. So this this squad could do it. And judging by how fast they're actually taking out the waves, I will just keep using them like that. This is a really good squad. Just so well balanced. Got a little bit of everything. We've got cooldowns, we've got lots of crowd control, lots of damage, more damage than I expected, and uh, just a lot of buffing. If they can't remove our buffs, they're going to have a hard time because we're just not taking really any damage. And our skills are never going to be on cooldown for more than a turn or two. So that's, you know, that's even better because we're going at like a two to one ratio. Like the slowest champ on my team is Mazo Mage and he's running at like 200 speed with about 500 resistance after all the buffs have been placed in defense boots. He has defense percent boots on. He's got like 50k HP and about 4k defense and he's just tanky as hell, man. Because once you put that 60% uh, increased defense on him, he's operating at like 5k defense, so it's just insane. Same thing with Glazia, just really benefits from having increased defense on her. A, because all of her skills are defensive based, all of her damage is based off of what her defensive stats are. And just, she's just really tanky in general. So she'll be operating with 4k defense again, 
With a 60% increased defense, she'll be operating at like 6.5k defense, which is insane. It's absolutely mammoth defense. As you can see, she'll never go down. Ever. She'll always be the last one on the team to go down. Your defensive stats should not be your first priority. Like, if you're going to put your champion 6k defense, but they only have like 130 speed, you're doing it wrong. They don't need 6k defense. What they need is you got to get your speed up first, and then get your accuracy up first, and then start specking into HP and defense. And resistance. Glazia's resistance is 300. So after Mazo Mage buffs the team, her resistance is like 400. Which is a lot of resistance. For the Doom Tower, that's going to get you through a lot of content. Yeah, I just don't understand this wave, man. After we just faced all these Hawkorn and Smash Lords, which is really good for PvE, and maybe not so much for PvE on your side or on arena pvp but pve hawkorn and smash lords are literally the most annoying champions in the game if you don't have a way to deal with them and tormens not even really that much of a threat honestly unless they're in arena but they still can be really annoying especially when they come in twos and threes Yeah, see, this is just insane. Just insane. Easy street. Easy street. Four twenty seven, that was a quick wave because it was such a trash wave. Astralis can be really annoying if you don't have a lot of HP. If you don't have a lot of a uh, of way to get HP quick or you pick up your dead champions because they have no HP. This squad here should be able to get through this wave. This squad here would probably be able to get through, honestly, most waves. <laughs> As you can tell, you don't really need a nuker for the Doomed Terror. You need more of a... You need another way to deal damage, because if you're nuking, you're not really going to be... You're... If you're putting in just a damage dealer, you're taking out a slot that could be crowd control or could be giving your team extra speed. The greatest champions for damage are the ones that can also do crowd control and do damage. Or some other type of funky passive like give off continuous heals to your entire team or something like that. But these waves are just no match for this team, man. We just wasted all of our skills, and I assure you we'll still be fine for the second wave. Because even if one of our team goes down and they don't have block revive, well, it doesn't matter because they'll just stun their whole team. But 
Let's say our team did go down. Well, as long as Syl can just pick up, uh, you know, one or two guys at a time, we'll still be okay. Because he will eventually pick someone up that can just stun their whole team or, you know, freeze their whole team and then we're off to the races again. Here we go. Because, like, when their whole team is stunned or frozen, they don't just lose one turn. They lose pretty much three turns because our team is going so much faster than they are. So it gives us time to cool down all of our skills and then just do it again. If you don't have Mazo Mage, a great alternative as a rare, and pretty much the closest thing you can get to a Mazo Mage is either a Seducer, which is from the same faction, or a Marked, which is a Barbarian rare, and uh, they both place block debuffs and increase defense as well. So just a lot easier to get. Mazo is also better though because he also does a cleanse. He'll cleanse the whole team and if he removes two debuffs or more from any ally, everybody gets a 15% turn meter boost, which is crazy. Just that in and of itself. But he also will heal the team by 20%. Which is insane. He's just an insane epic. He's one of the best epics in the game, man. If you have a Mazo Mage and you do not have him built out yet, and you're wondering why you can't get through content, it's because you haven't built out Mazo Mage. I'm pretty much guaranteeing you that. Because when I got my Mazo Mage at about like 90 days played, I was struggling in a lot of areas of the game. Because I didn't have a cleanser, and he just blew everything out of the water, man. And here we are at the Eternal Griffin. Eternal Griffin's kind of annoying. So it's pretty much just going to be... You don't want to use turn meter against the Griffin because he gets all the turn meter plus more that you just got. Um, and that's pretty much it. He's going to transfer debuffs and he's going to remove all debuffs as well. Can't freeze him, can't provoke him. So it's just going to be a matter of keeping your team alive and then trying to get as much damage in with a couple of damage dealers like Venus will do poisons. She also has a regeneration set on so she's not going to die. Again, you don't want to do turn meter boosting so that's a really bad idea here. Turn meter reduction, Geomancer is not a good option for this boss. You have a lot of resistance, that's a good uh, good thing for this boss. But it's probably a good idea to throw in a guy like Mazo Mage for this. The problem is that when he does remove your buffs, he gets a lot of counters. So you kind of do really... Isn't a bad idea to manual through this, but if you have enough resistance on your team, you could probably just power through it on auto. You might get a 40% or 50% win rate, but it's fine. 
And I'll show you exactly how to get through the boss on manual, just to show you that it is possible. I used to have a lot of problems with this boss, especially before I got Necrit. Armager is not going to be a good option for this because he's doing turn meter reduction. Cold Heart, again, not a good option for this map. And then obviously finding a team that can do it on auto. This team should be able to do it on auto because they have so much they have so much defense and so much shielding that it should be fine. And resistance too. I should have said that we have a lot of resistance, so we're going to be resisting anything that can't like the problem with Grithian is he has bu he has buff removal that's that can't be resisted, so... It doesn't matter how much resistance you have for that. He's gonna take all your buffs off. And then every time he takes a buff off, then he starts gaining counters. And once he gains, like, ten counters, your whole team's just start gonna get one-shotted. So, if we look at his skills here... He's going to come in first with this one, Death Gust, removes all buffs. Cannot be resisted. Damage increases by 10% for each buff removed. So do, the only buffs that can't be removed are un unremovable buffs, but do not buff your team on the first turn. The second turn, he's going to transfer all the debuffs from him to you and then fill his turn meter, 5% for each debuff transferred. So you don't want to buff or debuff until he uses this attack. And then these both will be on cooldown. And that's when you can start buffing your team. The Sky Bond is what he gets when he removes your buffs. So each bond increases his attack, crit rate, crit damage, and speed. So that's why he starts getting really, really hefty toward the end. Whenever an enemy's HP drops below 50, he places a heal reduction for two turns. So he makes it even worse for you. He also adds a sky bond at the beginning of every turn or when an enemy HP drops below 50%. When he has 10 or more Skybond buffs, he ignores shield, block damage, and unkillable. He's really annoying once he gets to 10 counters. You want to have most of his HP gone by the time he gets to 10 counters. Whenever his turn meter is decreased, all enemies' turn meters will be also decreased and then places a stun for one turn on enemies with fully depleted turn meters. Whenever an enemy's turn meter is filled, Grithian's turn meter will also be filled. The same amount. Turn meter increases are tracked and counted individually for each enemy. He also has Almighty Strength, Almighty Persistence, and Almighty Immunity, so you can't stun, free, sleep, provoke, block active skills, passive skills, fear, true fear, or petrification. Also immune to HP exchange, HP balancing, and cooldown increasing effects. So Warlord is not going to work on Grithian.
Okay, so he just removed. Um, like eight buffs, and that's how much damage he did, because he only has one counter right now. <coughs> so now we're gonna want to start buffing our team. And decreased attack is really good to have on Grithian as well. Uh, Rector Drath has decreased attack. Neckard has decreased attack, both on their A1, so it's really useful. And there. When we have the block debuffs up, and he transfers debuffs to us, whatever debuffs he has will be transferred to the whole team so that's why we want to have block debuffs up for when he uses his rock smash and now this can just be autoed because it will just cycle on its own now So yeah, all those fears on his A1, his A1 is a fear, he'll attack someone and place a fear. That's fine, it's all going to get resisted. Here comes the buff transfer. And it's just, see, it's just all getting resisted, so it's not a problem for us. We have more than enough team resist with Rector Drath. Mazo Mage and you know just uh, Necrit and just what resist they have on their own. They have an insane amount of resist. Now see Grithian's at seven counters, but it's a pretty even fight so far. I think Ninja has this. If we're still at full health, no one's gone down yet. As long as we keep resisting everything, that's just gonna be fine. We might start to face some pro run into some problems here uh, when he starts ignoring the shield. Like right now. We might need to use a revive or two here. Sometimes he does go on a little run. He'll take out your whole team in one shot. That's okay. That's just how it works. But if you got enough team resist, you should be okay to do this match more times than not. I think you'd want to have at least uh, 200 to 250 team resist by the time's all said and done to get through this stage of the Doom Tower without much of a problem. You see, he's still really not doing that much damage. Yeah. And that's a good thing. I mean, he's nearly got our God Seeker done, but that's fine. Rector will just pick her right back up again. She may even revive herself. And yeah, it's just, it's not happening, Grithian. You're not going to be placing any fear counters on anybody. And that's how that's done. It's usually a lot faster than nine minutes. The only reason it took nine minutes is because I was manualing and talking at, through half of it. But if you could see there, look at the rewards. Great rewards there. Some griffin feathers for legendary artifacts. And crafting guardian gear. So this is a farmable boss. You're definitely going to want to farm guardian gear. It's really good gear. It will give you... It will give your champion... Ally Protect, 10% for the whole team, plus 10% heal at the beginning of every turn. Let's see how long it takes to do on full auto. Since we have enough team resist, we're not going to be taking any debuffs from Grithian, so it should be a 100% win rate as well. The the where you start running into problems is when he transfers the debuffs 
For each debuff he successfully transfers to you, his attack goes up 10%. So those attacks are going to start dealing a lot of damage once he starts uh, getting into the, you know, 12, 13, 14 counters, Scythian counters. Those are going to start killing your whole team if he's transferring, if he's successfully transferring those debuffs. That's why it looks so easy, because he's not doing anything to my team. He's he's removing the buffs from my team, but that's all he's doing, you know. Where he starts to become really dangerous is when he starts transferring buffs to your team. Effectively increasing his turn meter as well. I mean, if he transfers even 10 debuffs to your team, that's two per person, he'll increase his turn meter by 50%. So he'll nearly be at his next turn. That's how he starts going really fast when that starts happening. It's one of the easiest bosses in the Doom Tower. The only hard part is, is getting the required resistance to be able to beat this boss. That is the hard part. But that's not very hard in reality. There's no luck involved in that. All you gotta do is just level up your Great Hall in Arena and farm gear with resistance substats on it and you'll be winning. Just look for gear with speed and resistance on it. As well as uh, accuracy or HP percent. Yeah, see, Ninja's the only one that's taking debuffs, so Ninja's resistance is really not that great. <laughs> but it's fine. He does so much damage, it's not even really... It's a good trade-off. You don't really want to be specking resistance into your damage dealers anyways, even if they are CC damage dealer. Their speed and their accuracy is going to be the most important thing. The rest of your team will take care of them. The rest of your team will keep them alive. Resistance is important on a cleanser because if your cleanser is getting debuffed and stunned and provoked and, you know, frozen and stuff like that, or turn meter reduction, you're going to run into a lot of problems because you're not going to be able to cleanse your team. Having your cleanser's resistance high is the most important resistance on your whole team. And it's just easy street. Like, he's not even doing any damage. This was a better run than last time. It's just, that's just the luck of the draw, right? Sometimes he, uh, he gets a lot, he gets a lot more extra turns and he does a lot more damage for that reason. This, this turn, this run, he didn't get as many turns. But if you can farm this boss in about five, six minutes, you're doing a good job. Now, even Ninja got a resist there, so as you can see, Ninja's resist is not really as bad as I thought it was. So that's great. That's, you know, that's it. You know, why that team works so well. Um, obviously, we have the, the resistance aura, Necrit. 
and then on Rector Draft, um, whenever an ally under a veil or a perfect veil gets a turn, heals them by 10% and also increases the resistance of allies under a veil or a perfect veil by 50. So it works really good with Ninja, because Ninja always has a perfect veil. Ninja's resistance is only 97. So once he gets the added bonus from Necrit, it's now at uh, 157. 167, 157, and then once he gets uh, this master here, is important to have on your on your buffers. Um, solidarity increases ally resist for each buff placed on them by this champion. Ally resist. Gives to your whole team. So say Necro puts four buffs or five buffs plus the shield buffs at the beginning of the round. That's four plus four, that's eight. So that's 40 extra resist for your whole team. And then Mazo goes ahead and places another four buffs. Another uh, three buffs on each person. with solidarity so we're adding all that up that's another four plus four plus that's 16 times five so that's uh that's an extra 80 resist so just off solidarity we're adding over 120 resist just from Neckard and and mazo mage with solidarity so that's like 200 resist with the aura on the whole team and then rectors plus 50 with the veils that's like an extra 250 resist you're already at the resist requirement and you haven't even looked at your base resist stat yet which is for mazo it's 411 and then with the extra that's so he's running at 670 resist when all those buffs are on He's not going to be taking any debuffs. And he's not even in that great of gear. Like, it's just shoddy gear that I found for him. A rare five star piece here for the shield. Like, it's not even that great. It has resistance on it, it has speed and defense percent. That's all you want for Mazo Mage. He does have a decreased speed on his A1, but it's really not even super, super important. If you don't build into accuracy for Mazo Mage, you'll still be okay. Alright, well I guess I'll just finish off my farming for the day, and I know it's been a really long video, but the Doom Tower is a crazy place to be, man. But it's well worth it, the rewards are well worth it, and uh, you know, you'll be helping You'll be uh, getting a lot more uh, out of your raid experience once you start powering through these Doom Tower waves and bosses. So, you know, that's all I got for you guys today. My name is Andrew, this is Black Dragon Studios. It's been another episode of I Play Raid Shadow Legends. Go ahead and check out the description, guys. There's a lot of stuff that I wasn't able to talk about in the video that's in the description. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I got for you guys. See you all in the next one.